He is God. And the only begotten Son of God. Who was conceived in the body of our Immaculate Lady. The Blessed Virgin. He has redeemed us from our sins. Resurrected us in our spirit. And given us the gift of everlasting life. He was resurrected from the cross. Our God. Our Holy Savior. The one we call. Serapis. It was told of him that he spoke prophecy and fulfilled it. And through his suffering and wisdom, all who believeth in him are reclaimed. He worked the miracle of healing, made the lame walk, and gave sight to the blind. You've heard these things before, and they probably bring Jesus to mind. When most of us think of a resurrecting Savior, the miraculous Son of God, we almost always think of Jesus Christ. After all, the only stories we hear today about a dying, rising Savior God are those told in the Christian Bible and in the churches that use it. But 2,000 years ago, that was hardly the case. There were numerous stories of other Saviors who had died and resurrected. And while these tales would later be told about Jesus Christ, they were actually created in the age before the New Testament. These stories began with the many savior cults that flourished throughout the ancient Mediterranean. And though a number of these cults contributed to the foundations of later Christianity, there is one in particular that seems especially interesting. Its leaders were called the Bishops of Christ, and they began singing their worship long before the name Jesus of Nazareth was ever written. As they sang their cherished hymns, the blessed name upon their lips was that of their Holy Savior, Serapis Christ. Who was Serapis Christ, and where did he come from? The god Serapis began as a redeeming savior of Egypt, where his cult originated centuries before the dawn of the Roman Empire. The cult of Serapis evolved from a number of religious and philosophical traditions, but its initial roots ultimately stretch back to the cults of the savior god, Osiris, and Memphis's bull god, Apis. Osiris was the original dying and rising savior god of the ancient Mediterranean, and he was worshipped as a god of spiritual renewal and resurrection. He was born of a virgin, and after enduring great suffering here on earth, he passed on to the peace of his eternal abode. There he sat on his throne as the redeemer of departed souls, the merciful judge of the Egyptian dead in their afterlife. The Egyptian bull god, Apis, was called the Lord of Heaven and the giver of everlasting life. Apis was originally considered the incarnation of the Holy Creator here on earth, but later Apis also became the soul or Holy Spirit of the same universal God whom he incarnated. According to Herodotus, Apis was believed to be born of a virgin mother who had become impregnated by a spark sent by God the Father. Thus, by the 5th century BCE, the Egyptians had developed the notion of God the Father, His Divine Son, and the Holy Spirit of God being incarnated into the flesh and blood of a single earthly being. Sometime during Egypt's New Kingdom, Priests at Memphis began combining Osiris and Apis into a single deity, believing they had found the secret of a god who was both the original creator of the universe and who could also guarantee everlasting life and spiritual salvation. Their new god came to be called Aserapi, and they established a grand temple at Memphis called the Serapium in his honor. As this cult evolved, the name of the god changed somewhat, and Aserapi became known as Serapis. 
Over time, the rites of Serapis began to be celebrated alongside those of the goddess Isis, the Immaculate Lady and Celestial Virgin, who was also known as both the mate of Osiris and his virgin mother during Osiris' earthly reincarnation. In the 3rd century BCE, the center of the Serapis cult moved northward from Memphis to the capital city of Alexandria, on the southern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. There, Pharaoh Ptolemy I replaced the small, ancient temple of Serapis that existed before Alexander's arrival with a grand new edifice, one even larger and more spectacular than the Serapium at Memphis. This monumental temple contained an annex that connected to the Great Library of Alexandria, which helped the Alexandrian Serapium become the ancient world's foremost center of learning. Within Alexandria's Serapium, one could access a library containing as many as 500,000 to 700,000 books of classical learning, before it was destroyed by Christians in the year 391 CE. During its Alexandrian period, the cult underwent a process of further refinement. Serapis became the manifest identity of the resurrected gods Osiris and Apis possessing all of their wisdom and character while absorbing certain elements and motifs from Greek philosophy and mystery cults. This evolution brought on the Golden Age of Serapis, and the following centuries saw the Serapis cult become the most widespread religious institution in the Roman Empire. Serapian temples were found in lands as far distant as the British Isles in the west to beyond the Parthian frontier in the east and some writers reported that the cult even had centers as far away as northern India and western China. Serapis, who was often called the good savior, Crestus, or Christus, the anointed one, was known as a healing god, and the leaders of his cult, the Abbas, or bishops of Crestus, were believed to have been imbued with his gift of healing. Throughout the ancient world, People flocked to their local Serapium to be cured of their ailments and afflictions through priestly oracles and the laying on of hands, and the Serapium maintained spacious accommodations for those who sought and received miraculous cures. The Emperor Vespasian himself recorded that he received the gift of miraculous healing during a prophetic oral at a Serapium, which enabled him to restore sight to a blind man and restore the lame, withered legs of a cripple. As the experience of Vespasian suggests, Serapis was not only a god of healing, but also one who granted the gift of prophecy and its fulfillment. Serapis endowed his followers with his gift, usually through the means of divine dreams, oracles, and prophetic visions. Serapis was also a god of wisdom, both common and esoteric. He was called the Word, or Logos, and it has been recorded that Philo Judaeus of Alexandria wrote a lost tractate on the significance of Serapian belief to the emergence of his Alexandrian philosophy. The importance of this cannot be overstated, for it seems that Philo's Alexandrian philosophy provided the primary formulations that laid the groundwork for the establishment of Christianity. The cult of Serapis had a number of internal organizations, including monastic and ascetic orders. Perhaps the best known of these was called the Therapeutae, from the same Greek root that gives us the modern word therapy. This order specialized in practicing the healing arts in outside communities, beyond the confines of the Serapium. Inscriptions dedicated to the Therapeutae of Serapis survive in a number of far-flung locations, from Delos to Cyzicus to Magnesia and beyond, and they all attest to this order's global esteem. Even our friend Philo of Alexandria wrote in praise of the Therapeutae's healing craft, and noted that certain Therapeutae were actively melding Judean religious beliefs with Serapian rites and traditions in the first century. The Therapeutae are especially important because fathers of the Christian Church, such as Eusebius and Jerome, recalled that the Therapeutae were actually the first Christians, with Eusebius noting that the Therapeutae were among the earliest keepers of the Christian Gospels and Epistles. Serapis's status as a predecessor to Jesus Christ cannot reasonably be doubted. Serapis was called the Christ, the Good Shepherd, and the Healer of the World. 
His atoning sacrifice led to his resurrection from the dead. The sign of the cross was central to Serapian worship, and sacred crosses used by his worshippers have been found in his temples, alongside the inlaid monograms we typically associate with Jesus Christ. Serapis ruled and expressed his power through the twelve signs of the zodiac, which are generally seen as forerunners to Jesus Christ's symbolic twelve apostles. While some Gnostic sects adopted Serapis as the universal godhead, others within the proto-Christian movement refined and emphasized his role as the resurrected savior. This offshoot stayed closely aligned to the parent cult for some time, which is why, at the dawn of the Christian era, observers were unable to perceive any real distinction between the Serapis cult and its Christian offspring. Serapis is a long-forgotten yet extremely important part of our heritage. In remembering him, we recall a bit of ourselves, as we discover a path back into the ancient milieu that gave rise to our own. The memory of Serapis provides us with a glimpse of our own religious origins, and teaches us lessons that will better enable us to command our path in the future. So let us once again behold Serapis, the forgotten Christ.